Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Anne Mostu. I'm a news reporter for Bloomberg Financial News here in Boston. I cover biotech, mostly publicly traded biotech companies, and some startups. Uh, Bob Coughlin probably needs no introduction, nor does David Meeker, but I will still introduce them. Bob is the president and CEO of MassBio, and David Meeker is currently the CEO of KSQ Therapeutics in Cambridge, working on CRISPR technologies. And previously, he spent two decades at Genzyme and Sanofi Genzyme. He is standing in today for Steve Eubel because the storm has present, prevented Steve from coming today and traveling. So we promise a very candid, maybe provocative conversation about the reputation of the pharmaceutical industry right now. And we will take your questions at the end. Just want to make sure you're aware of that first. I'm going to take a seat. I'm going to switch from the podium. Is, is this mic? Yeah. OK. Here you go. Um, we are going to start um, by talking about the multi-million dollar public relations campaign that Big Pharma has launched in the past year to really save its reputation. So we're going to watch two ads from Pharma and then talk about them. So why don't we roll those? Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Do not go gentle into that good night. one one of those ads right now. So Big Pharma is obviously not planning on going gentle into that night. The drug industry's largest trade group and lobbying arm of uh, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, or Pharma, which is what Steve Eubel represents, launched this campaign aimed at getting the public and, of course, lawmakers to sympathize with the increasingly maligned industry, which has been slammed left and right because of exorbitant drug price hikes. So let's talk a little bit about this campaign your reaction to the ads, and, and whether you think they're being effective. Do you want to start, David? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I think, um, I mean, we watch that, I haven't seen that ad before, I've seen others. Uh, you know, there's an immediate feel of marketing, and I'm being marketed to. Um, I think one of the challenges for our industry and what we forget is that uh, what this industry does is not about sales and marketing. I think where we make the headlines often is around sales and marketing, but the, the reality is, is that um, it is about the unmet need and you know, parts of that ad captured the idea that um, we're all patients. Um, I think, again, that's a part that we don't always get right in our communications. We tend to talk about patients as though there's some foreign element um, when in reality um, you know, we've all been in that situation or somebody we've loved has been in that situation and so we understand the vulnerability of being sick and counting on um, and hoping for uh, a cure or an intervention that will you know allow us to get through that moment so I think this is an attempt by industry I, I to be honest with you I, I think there's many more things we can and need to be doing that probably um, can help people understand the role of industry in this equation better than the pure marketing campaign. I'm not sure that speaks to the best side of ourselves, but, uh, but the intent is a good one. Okay. Bob? The reason we wanted to have this panel and the reason Steve Eubel from Pharma was invited because we want to talk, it's important that we talk about how we change the image of the industry because all of us in this room know why we do this, but yet we have to 
get that message out to people that don't work in this industry, right? And I want to start off by thanking David Meeker because when we found out that Steve Hubel couldn't make it yesterday because of the weather, I was eating lunch with David Meeker. And he said, Bob, is there anything I can do to help Mass Bio in my new role? I said, it's funny you should ask. What are you doing tomorrow at 1130? And, and here we are. So David, I realize you're never gonna eat lunch with me ever again. And I thought it came with lunch, but I found yeah, out that's next. I still let him pick the next it up. Panel. <laughs> but what we, and, and David is a pers perfect person to talk about this because of your experience on the bio board down in Washington, D.C., your experience working for a, a large company, and now your experience working with a smaller company that's trying to bring uh, therapies to sick people. And for me, you know, I'll put on my cystic fibrosis dad hat a little bit because I've loved this industry and I've loved all the people that work in this industry because it represented hope for my kid that was born with an expiration date. And the outlook for him 15 years ago was not good. And now because of amazing people, many of whom in this room and everything that folks that work in research and development do and the people that work in the biopharma industry, right? It's one industry now. How come we don't have a better reputation with people. Why do people up and down, you know, any, you can even talk to your neighbors, oh, why are drugs so expensive? You guys are screwing us, right? That's what you hear from everybody. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, these are the people that are saving lives, like Kaylee Brown that was on the, the, the panel earlier with the Dana Farber and the Jimmy Fun folks. What is it that we need to do? How do we, and that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit today, what do we need to do as an industry to change our behavior what behavior needs to change, and what is it that we can do to change our reputation? Commercials are great, and I appreciate the fact that bio and pharma down in Washington, D.C. are making efforts to try to change our impression and educate the public, but you know, how, how effective are TV commercials, right? You know, what more do we need to do? So that'd be a great topic. So thank you, thank you, my friend David, for being here. Well, speaking of TV, I mean, those of us in the media have to take some responsibility, right, because of the obsession with <clears throat> Martin Screlly or Valiant. Yeah. I mean, do you think that, that that's part of the problem, that, that there's just too much focus on one or two bad apples? So uh, th there's no question that the, the financial aspects of this industry are a problem. And when you get individuals or examples like Martin, Martin Screlly or Valiant, um, they make the headlines, they're exciting reading, they, they shape, obviously, uh, an image, um, but in fact, they're you know, very isolated examples. Um, I think those can be put in a certain context. I, I think our bigger challenge is that um, all of us, um, you know, in one way or another, we, we often end up at the pharmacy window and you know, we're paying for something and we don't, don't understand how it could cost that much or um, why it seems to be so inequitable. Um, you know, I, I paid this, somebody else paid that. Um, you know, Europe pays much less. I mean, there's just so many aspects of that equation where um, we, we, are, we see it as unfair um, and in many cases unaffordable. And so um, that's a fundamental problem in terms of you know, trying to get people to see beyond that, um, that moment at the pharmacy window. When we go into the hospital, um, you know, Bob and I have talked about this many times, it's, it's, Alzheimer's is not going to be cured by a hospital bed. It's not going to be cured um, by an imaging uh, procedure. It's, it's, you know, all those things may be important elements of care, but the, the breakthrough is gonna come from this industry, and that breakthrough may be 10 years away, but if we don't have a system that is able to support that kind of long-term investment, we will not get there. And if we don't get there, not only are we as individuals going to be devastated by that, but society as a whole is going to be devastated. So there's this massive disconnect between that moment at the, uh, the pharmacy window and um, the incredible importance of an industry that is trying to solve you know, the biggest challenges, you know, climate change, I mean, but healthcare and, you know, the, the devastating diseases that shorten our lives. Um, so I think that's our challenge. I mean, I think your, your question was, do I think they shape, the, they absolutely shape it and they make that challenge of, you know, helping people understand what's behind the system and the, the journey that it takes to bring forward something that is truly transformative. 
Bob, what is MassBio doing to improve the reputation of biotech companies here in Massachusetts, but nationwide, because so many of them are, are big names? We've, we've done a couple of things over the past decade. The first piece that is that we use to educate public officials, elected officials, key opinion leaders, as well as the population, was telling the story around the patient. I think once you start talking about what this means to sick people, you immediately have a captive audience because everybody knows and loves somebody who's experiencing an unmet medical need. So when you come to it with that context, you don't bring in the CEOs that are making lots of money with all due respect to CEOs that are making lots of money. You lead with the constituents that those people represent, that those elected officials represent, and you talk about how important it is. Just like I was you know, before I had this job when I was advocating for my son with cystic fibrosis. That's the first piece. And the second piece now, as we educate policy leaders and elected officials, we have to talk about the broken system. Let's face it, folks. Pharmaceuticals are about 14% of the overall cost of health care. Right? If drugs were free, we're still not solving the problem of the rising cost of health care. What is the problem? We have a sick care system. We have a system, a payer system, again, that the average folks, 90% of the community probably is never going to understand, right? We have a sick care system that is set up to pay for chronic illness and chronic treatment, right? Just recurring treatment. So now introduce a cure to hepatitis C or gene therapy or these, these drugs, these therapies that not only change the course of disease, but in some cases we use the word cure now, right? Who is, we don't have a system that can absorb upfront costs. And those costs are big. I tell people that the, the Martin Scarelli thing was a blessing in disguise because it gave us an opportunity to teach politicians that the generic industry is different than the innovative industry. And it gave us a chance to educate a lot of folks from the press as well, Anne. And you're not one of the bad ones. You're great. That's why you're sitting with us here today. But, <laughs> but folks from the press, it is easier to talk about, oh, Martin Scarelli's evil, pharma industry's evil. Well, he's not the pharma industry. So let's talk about the fact that the generic industry, we need, the, the reason you have uh, the generic industry and a pathway to generics is so that you can, the drugs get cheaper after the patent life is up and you have headspace to absorb new therapies. When you upset that apple cart by upping the price of generic, industry, generic drugs, you're not allowing that headspace for new therapies. So that was a blessing. And then on the other piece, we need to educate them that the payer system needs to change. They aren't designed to absorb upfront costs. How could you argue that a cure for hepatitis C is a bad thing. It's going to save trillions of dollars in the long run, in costs avoided. The best way you can save money in the healthcare system is to cure somebody. But no payer in the world can account for a cure or costs avoided. That's a problem. That's a problem for private payer and public payer. You look at Mass Health and Medicaid, too. We're constantly working with folks in leadership and government to say we need to really change the way we account for the payer system because it, it, it would be completely logical if the pharmaceutical percentage went up because of these great therapies, it's going to keep people out of the hospital. You're going to save money, but who accounts for that? It's going to keep people alive. That's great. Who puts a price on that? It's going to keep people working and paying taxes. I could go on and on, but yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, but that's that's what we got to do, right? We got to educate everybody. It's, it's go, no, go ahead, David. No, I, <coughs> that's why I decided to come up here because I knew I'd just be able to hang out. And no, no, you see. <laughs> So, uh, which is always a good thing. Um, but I think the generic question is, is super interesting, right? Because at one, and we live in a, for better or worse, and I'm going to argue for better, a market-based economy. And yeah. this is a market-based part of that economy. So there's a supply and demand issue here. And so when a generic drug, the price rises on a generic drug, it's because there's a shortage of supply. And somebody can take advantage of that inequity and, of course, will raise the price. Now, we can say, yeah, it's health care. It shouldn't do it. It's on the back of whatever. But I think my, my point about that is that this is complicated. And let's not rush to judgment on some of these and say, why is there a supply in that? What is it about the generic structure that caused people to stop making that drug, leaving only one manufacturer, leaving one? So that's point number one. Point number two, the generic story is the most fabulous story in this equation. 90% of the drugs that are used in the United States today, as we know, are generic. The ones that make the headline are in the 10%, and then in that 10% are amazing medical discoveries and breakthroughs. So 
you know, should gene therapy cost a million dollars an eye? I don't know. I mean, but let's have that conversation. I think that's an interesting conversation. It's not a no. Maybe it's not a yes, but it's an interesting conversation. But 90% of the drugs used are generic drugs, and the story we don't hear today are statins. Nobody walks up and says, hey, let's talk about statins. One of the most amazing breakthroughs, Pfizer printed money for a number of years. Now it's pennies a day. And it has an unbelievable modifying effect on our cardiovascular risk. It's no longer a story. Why isn't it a story? It's an unbelievable gift forevermore, unless somebody stops and we're only left one manufacturer. I don't think that's going to happen with statins. They're going to be making us and our children and their children better. And that was, you know, that's the cycle. That's the way it worked. Yeah, Pfizer made a lot of money for a few years. Now, forevermore. To pick up on something Bob said, it's interesting to me as a reporter, so often when companies, pharma, biopharma, biotech, come to me to pitch a story, or your PR folks do, I'll ask if there's a patient I can talk to from a trial, and they say, oh no, you know, that's HIPAA, we can't, we can't find you a patient, we can't do that. And it, it's just, even though most of Bloomberg listeners, subscribers, viewers, readers are investors, they are still reading stories much more frequently if it opens with a patient um, than if it opens with the CEO or a summary of what the FDA is thinking or what the phase three trial was. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, I, have to, I have to make that plug as a reporter because it's just what people want. Oh, absolutely, and that's why as a trade association, not working for a specific company that's bound by those rules, we try to work with all sorts. That's why we have a patient advocacy day. That's why we work with the patient advocacy folks from all of our member companies. We want to build a database and a pool of those patients that can be advocates for us. We should educate all the disease foundations so that they can be ambassadors for our industry because, again, if you just leave it up to the press to cover bad actors, right. we're never going to win that. We need to be able to fight back. Right. And, and the other part of that, going back yeah. to the, um, the ad, right? I mean, what, what the ad was trying to convey is that, you know, at the foundation of this industry are a vast number of employees, you know, who are, who are working here because they believe in what they do. And I, I think, you know, that part of it, and, you know, this is a room full of people who work in the industry, um, you know, I've always been struck. I mean, that our face to the public, to Bob's point about high-priced CEO or high-paid CEOs and the like, isn't always the one that the public is most willing to listen to, and secondarily, the one that's best able to articulate why we do what we do. And you know, I came out of a large company. I'm in a small company now, and in both places, um, you know, the vast majority of the individuals were there because they wanted to make a difference. They, the, the possibility of, of finding a treatment for a disease and connecting with that disease. The employees, as much or more than anybody, want to connect with the people they're helping. I mean, this is an industry which is just, it's so connected with human nature and the things that drive us as people and the, you know, the, the ability and desire to help someone. And, you know, these are smart people. They can make money many different places, but they choose to work here. And, you know, 99% of them aren't there because they think their company's going to be bought and they're going to get rich overnight, right? They're there because they believe in what they're doing and they believe because they understand the problem. They've connected with it, either personally or they've heard somebody's story. And as a leader, you know, the opportunity to build a company aligned around a purpose, you know, the ability to say, you know, we can change that person's life or the next person who gets that disease um, drives a completely different level of commitment than if I was just making, had a company that was making washing machines. It's, right, it's hard to get people fired up about that, but, but to connect people with what we do in that life-changing nature, it's just, it's a gift of this industry, and, and it's present in virtually every single company in our industry, but it doesn't have a voice in the same way that some of these headline-making pieces do. Well, we're seeing more collaboration and partnering among big pharma and smaller biotechs and even med tech companies. How do you think that's changing the dynamic and maybe the reputation in the industry? That's a great question. I, I mean, I go back a decade ago, and we were in Massachusetts. We were used to lead with, and people used to actually say it, let's lead with the white hat of biotech, right? We were the white hat, good folks, good guys trying to 
cure disease, we weren't screwing anybody, right? But Big Pharma, on the other hand, were the bad guys, and they were charging people money. It's all one industry now. If you look at 18 out of the top 20 pharma companies have a physical presence here in Massachusetts now. When you go back to 2007 and into 2008, 9, 10, and 11 when the market crashed, we still grew here in Massachusetts by partnering with the pharma industry. You know, so it's the biopharma industry. You look at where we're going with convergence now and diagnostics, companion diagnostics, devices, combination products. It's, we call it the life sciences industry now here in Massachusetts, and we're the best place in the world for it. We have to take that and look at it as an opportunity to move forward and change the image of the industry. And, and like I said, a TV commercial is great, but what more do we need to do? We have, you know, here in Massachusetts, it's, it's a little bit easier than it is for colleagues from other parts of the state, other parts of the country that don't have a large life sciences workforce. Hey, the folks, we, we say it all the time here in Massachusetts. If you're a governor or a, a legislator or any elected official, if you're not gonna support the life sciences industry in Massachusetts, you might as well hang up your political career. That's like someone from Florida trying to crush the orange industry or someone from Iowa trying to crush the corn industry. And I do, I say it to the paper, right? It's a good way to keep them in line. But it is, because we're a driving force in the economy. We represent $9.8 billion in payroll right now just in R&D. That's crazy. Okay, so we take advantage of that. And the folks on the, in California can as well. But let's think of the entire country, right? Let's think of when you meet with a legislator. I have two colleagues here, uh, the head of life sciences from South Dakota and Kentucky. Where are you guys? You here? You didn't have to sit in the back, guys. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> When I meet with colleagues from all over the country, they're like, well, we all have two U.S. senators, right? They all have an equal vote. You can't just rely on the two from Massachusetts and the two uh, from California to support you. In fact, you can't even always rely on them. That was off the record, Ann. And <laughs> <laughs> so you can't expect the senators from Kentucky or, North Dakota, or South Dakota to be receptive, they don't have a huge life sciences industry. It's getting better and it's getting bigger and we continue to work with folks across the country to grow the life sciences industry because there's great ideas and great science everywhere. But, but the reality is we need to educate politicians and elected officials across the country and the only way they, we can do that is if we educate all of our employees and we educate the disease foundations because disease doesn't discriminate. There's just as many kids with CF, if not more in those states than there are in Massachusetts. Right, and the CF Foundation has a presence there. And I just use that as, as one example of many disease foundations. I'd like to see a way if we can get together with pharma and bio nationally and just own our own reputation. We cure diseases. We're scientists, we're smart people, we're people that do amazing work, yet our, our reputation is there with the tobacco or oil industry. That's ridiculous. And we should be in charge of leading our way out of it. And believe it or not, Things like focusing on gender diversity and inclusivity. Do, always doing the next right thing. Telling the truth. Pricing things realistically. Hey, these drugs are expensive. It if it costs $8 billion to invent a drug that's only going to work for X amount of people, it's going to be expensive. But to David's point, it's only going to be expensive for a set period of time before it goes generic. And then we're on to the next thing the next cure. So I think we always need to lead with the story, what we do for sick people, and the fact that we're not making me too drugs. We're not doing that here. We're trying to change the course of disease and cure disease. And when we tell that story, politicians buy into it. A lot of times when you meet with a politician, and that's something that I do for a living on behalf of all of you, and I am a recovering politician, don't hold it against me. Um, <laughs> when you meet with these elected officials, they'll tell you, hey, Bob, I get it. You and your team have educated on it, us on this, and we get it, but I can't go to Stop and Shop or, 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 or Star Market without having 15 people tell me that they can't afford their drugs, the co-payments are too big. Well, you can buy your statin for cheaper than your co-payment is in many cases now. How do you explain that to somebody? Geez, the pharmacist can't even tell you that because they're bound by a gag law. We need to change that. And those are the things that we work on, and it's just, it's so tricky. So my my call to action and our call to action is to how do we as a national industry, international industry, right, how do we take responsibility for our own reputation and change that? But no one else is going to do it for us. Right. Nobody. Well, you bring up a good point. Let's talk about middlemen. Let's talk about pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs. I mean, what responsibility do you think 
they have in all this, because they definitely are playing a role in the drug pricing. You bet. Does anyone understand that? We do. Maybe we this do. room does, yeah. but, but the public doesn't. No, no. And, and that's why we are filing legislation in, across the country in different states. And in Massachusetts, it's been a topic with new health care reform bills that the, the pharmacy benefit managers need to be called to the table with us and be part of the solution. And you think about transparency legislation, let's talk about transparency as it relates to what really means something. How much does it cost? How much R&D do we put into things? But also, where is all this fallout after discounts and rebates? Where do the PBMs fit in? Where's all that money going? I mean, if it's a consumer advocacy piece of legislation so that the customer and the patient can be educated, it has to be all the way from the beginning until when the, the, the customer has it prescribed and dispensed to them. David, what are you thinking about with your company? I mean, obviously you're private. You're uh, deciding where you want to, what direction you want to go in, and uh, with regard to pricing, how are you making decisions? So, <clears throat> the the day we get to worry about pricing will be a great day, and I <laughs> look look forward to that day. Um, so, uh, I'll answer you more broadly. Um, you know, pricing, as we said, and as we all know, um, whether it's in the individual abuse situation or sort of the more general impression of industry uh, charging too much. We, we have to own the pieces that we should own. And what I mean by that is um, taking a year-on-year -year price increase, double-digit price increase without adding value is not defensible. And every time we try to defend it, everybody goes, there's no defense to that. Why are you trying to defend something that's indefensible? You sound bad. You're not helping the industry. And I'm not... I am being critical of, because I've, I've sat in the seats that have to make those decisions, but it's wrong. And until we make a decision to begin to self-regulate ourselves, which is starting to happen, we run the huge risk that somebody's going to turn around and regulate us for us. And the day that happens, this industry is in an enormous amount of pain. I mean, the moment we get close to price controls, the whole world that we depend on, which is I'm going to put my venture capital into an industry which is unbelievably risky and unbelievably long in terms of the life cycle with no confidence that I can get the return on that, realizing I'm going to have many failures and so the ones that hit need to have a disproportionate level of return. You know, we, we will hurt society. We will, of course, damage this industry in a way we can't begin to imagine. So. So for me, that can't happen. But the reason it would happen is because we as an industry are sitting there and saying, I can take my 10%, 15% price increase year over year because I can. And, and we're starting to get companies who are stepping up and saying, look, we're going to take a pledge and, and say, we will not increase our prices more than you know, inflation or you know, whatever. But I, I think that, that's such a critical piece. And we have to rally around that as an industry before somebody, like I said, you know, imposes that upon us. Um, now, with that, then I think we can have, you know, good discussions around how do we value innovation? Because as a rule, that innovation isn't necessarily going to be treating large swaths of the population. We're moving into a personalized medicine, you know, world. There'll be higher prices treating fewer people. Hepatitis C was, you know, I mean, I love that story. It's such an incredible story. I hope we learn from that story which is we had this unbelievable, transformative, curative <coughs> intervention. You know, hepatitis C we hopefully will follow is the path of polio, and you know, we can mm. eradicate hepatitis C um, from this earth. Because of that kind of intervention, it just hit in one year. It was so, you know, you, know, you could just foresee you know, the hands going up. And so those are the things we need to learn from and say, OK, when we predict and we can see that kind of stuff coming, how do we manage it? And there's a lot of good discussion ongoing. So my last thing back on the payers and how do I think about the payers, so I spent a lot of time with payers and in those rooms. And just like in the industry, um, there's no part of the system that's trying to screw the other parts of the system. They're just trying to work their place in a market-based economy. And in that process, you know, contracts are put in place that tie you up for five years and the flexibility of payers to turn around. So for we tried to in a, another life, disrupt that system. And they were eager to have it disrupted, but they weren't able to disrupt it because 
the contracts lock them in for a certain number of years. So you know, these things take time to unwind, and they're unbelievably complicated and hard to understand. But the alternative is we throw it all away, and we become a single-payer system, and you know, we can have a good debate about whether that you know, is a good thing or a bad thing. I think it'll be tough to think about an innovative industry surviving in a single-payer system. There's not an enormous amount of innovation that's coming out of Canada or Europe or the Nordics in the healthcare space. It's not that there's none. As a large company, we were pulling our sites out of a number of those companies, R&D sites, because it's, you can do R&D in many places. There's a huge value to doing it in a place which recognizes innovation. It's a different equation. So there's a reason the United States makes most of the stuff, that the new drugs disproportionately, vastly disproportionately, come out of a United States-based system. So again, back to complicated, let's not rush to judgment on any part of this equation. Let's accept the fact that we all have responsibility here. But for the parts we own, let's own them and change them, and then become active members of this debate in trying to shape the rest of the equation, which also need to change. Well, thank you both. We're aware that we stand between you and lunch, so we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience, and then we'll break. Um, anybody? There's microphone folks walking around. Yeah. Go Somebody right ask ahead. Susan. Stand up. Feel free to stand up. Hi, I'm Leora Ship with Altia Strategy Consulting. I want to thank you for this great conversation. And I want to pick up on the role that generics have played in giving headroom to uh, innovative uh, therapeutics. Uh, going forward, a lot of the innovations are complicated biologics. And so the next level of this is going to have to be biosimilars. And so far, we haven't seen a lot of them make it to the market. And the ones that have aren't discounted in the same way that you see with a pill because of cost of goods and the fact that it, there's a much greater hurdle getting to the market, so there's no need to do that. So could you talk a little bit about what you see as the future for biosimilars and how that's going to play out? Can I take that? Please. <laughs> so, um, we're on a journey here, and you know we're learning how to bring to move into a biosimilar world, if you will. Right. So you know the first biosimilar is how similar are they? They're not identical. You know, are they going to be antigenic and create an immune reaction? Are you going to have antibodies? I mean, there's lots of questions in this biologic world which required more work, as you said, and then of course the cost of goods. Now, what's been interesting is that. When you go in to negotiate pricing, it used to be you were put head to head with the molecule, your identical molecule. So if there is a generic, you're living in that world. If there is a true biosimilar, you might be living in that world. Now it's, you're being put head to head with something in your class. The amount of time that you were alone in your class, if you look, how many PD-1s are in development today? Right? They're talking about PD-1s, these unbelievable drug interventions. Twenty. 30 PD-1s in development. Now, they are going to be biosimilars, biodifference, whatever. I can tell you the payer is going to look at that and say, I only need three PD-1s on my formulary. Make your bid. You're, you're, I realize you're not identical. You're close enough. I'm only going to fund three. There's only going to be two TNFs on my formula, formulary. I realize you're not identical. Close enough. Make your bid. So this is where this world is going, and I think we as an industry don't fully appreciate it, but that, that amount of time, so that's why for me, let the market forces work here before we get government people jumping in who have no, no ability to understand the complexity and all the downstream ramifications of what they might intervene on. Let these forces work. It moves slowly, right? It's not that 2019 is going to be radically different from 2018, but 2022 is, 
And that's a really short period of time in this industry. Yeah. So. Good question. So I'm going to come at this from a completely different point of view. Um, and really interesting to hear you guys, your exchange. Thank you for that. Um, so my question is part question, part comment, and this actually goes to everybody in the room. Um, but is my question is, have you considered or what are you doing? Um, or And if you're not uh, doing this, m my suggestion would be to do the following of engaging with the quote unquote next generation and youth, right? So you talk about talking with politicians and you talk about you know, people being reticent to being marketed to. Um, you are in all in competition with the next generation of brilliant scientists, engineers, the next leaders of the biotech revolution. And I would encourage all of you to start reaching out to those students. With all due respect, they are smarter than any of you, any of us. <laughs> um, I run a program, uh, international program, for th that is creating these current and future leaders of this biotech revolution. Um, we have 30,000 uh, alumni worldwide. Uh, it's called iGEM. We have 6,000 participants every year from 46 countries around the world. And let me tell you, they are inspiring. They are brilliant. And if they don't want to listen to you, you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> Um, so my question again is, have you considered, have you thought about how you're going to engage with this sort of young generation of youth? Real quick to wrap yeah. up in, I'll take that if you want. Mass BioEd Foundation, you're going to hear a little bit more about that later in the annual meeting. Okay. We do have a program that we work in all the, the schools here in Massachusetts to engage the, the next generation of scientists. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful point. I think also though we've got to continue to work on fixing the system for the next generation. Uh, we're looking at things like value-based payments. How do we change the interaction between the payers, the providers, and us as the innovators? And here in Massachusetts, through NEHI, we do have a working group that's doing that. And I couldn't agree with you more. We've got to engage the next generation. You'll hear and see more about how we're going to do that. But we also got to start fixing some of the fundamental flaws of the sick care system here and really turn it into a health care system. Thank you. Great. Well, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you, Bob and David. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.